Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. Our guest today is Oliver Crisp, and we'll be talking about his book, Deviant Calvinism, Broadening Reform Theology. Oliver, welcome to this episode of Fortress Press Live. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Well, let's begin by giving the listeners a chance to get to know you better. Tell us a bit about your background and as well as your current teaching role there at Fuller Theological Seminary. I'd be delighted, delighted to do so. As you may tell from my accent, I'm not from Southern California where I currently live. Originally, I'm from London in England, and I grew up there and then went to Scotland to study at university and eventually came back to London to do my PhD and then taught at the University of St. Andrews for a few years, had a couple of sojourns in brief sojourns in the United States at uh, postdoctoral fellowships at Notre Dame and Princeton and uh, taught for six years at the University of Bristol in England before coming over in 2011 to Fuller Theological Seminary and that's where I teach at the moment. And my title is Professor of Systematic Theology so that's really pretty much what I teach here at Fuller. I teach Christian doctrine for uh, master's degree students, MA, T students and MDiv students as well as teaching courses at the THM and PhD level as well. Well, thanks for helping us to get to know you a little better. The book we're talking about today is called Deviant Calvinism. And in the opening pages, you talk about how this book really was a long time in the making. Uh, Give us some insight into the story and the timeline behind this book. The book is the product of a, a period of rumination, I think. And part of that was to do with me going deeper into the Reformed tradition and reading more both in the tradition itself as well as of the recent historical literature that's sort of emerged over the last 10, 20 years, which is seeking to reassess the way we look at Reformed history and Reformed doctrine. And a number of the writers of the books of this historical material have argued in various different ways that the sort of way that the Reformed tradition is often packaged in textbooks, certainly slightly older textbooks now, is mistaken in some respects. So, for example, you have this debate about whether Calvin was a Calvinist, and a lot of this recent literature has said that's really not an appropriate question, that there's a, uh, Calvin wasn't the, ever the only Reformed theologian, and there's always going to be a development in a doctrinal development in a tradition, and Calvin is just simply one representative of that tradition. And then there was another question in this literature about whether there's a single defining doctrine for Calvinism, or whether that single defining doctrine is predestination. And these historians have shown that that was never really a defining doctrine of the Reformed tradition, and the Reformed tradition has a rich and variegated doctrinal history that's misrepresented by trying to squeeze the whole of the richness of that tradition into one notion or or one topic. So that was one of the things that got me thinking, and another was just the reading of a number of authors in the Reformation tradition that I hadn't spent so much time with, and I came to see that there are a number of issues that were either underreported in contemporary theology or perhaps in some respects were misreported or perhaps in some respects a sort of broad range of issues were reduced to a single option in the contemporary literature. And that drew me to thinking that it might be an interesting project to try and get people to rethink some of these issues, particularly around the matter of salvation and the scope of salvation, getting them to see that there were resources in the Reformed tradition that perhaps they weren't aware of, that in some respects problematized the way we thought of these issues in the kind of textbook way that we're taught them these days, and uh, helped us to recover something of the richness of the tradition that perhaps isn't always understood today. All right. Well, thanks for giving us a bit of the backstory. Always helpful to understand that. Now, picking up on a few key words from the title, I wonder if you might give us kind of the working definition you, you go with in the book for Calvinism and Reformed theology, I think, depending on who we're talking to, people have some pretty specific meaning behind those words. And then maybe a little bit of commentary about those elements of either Calvinism or Reformed theology that causes you to have the word deviant in the book's title. Well, I mean, deviant can mean something sort of bad, but it can just mean something that's different from a norm. And it's the latter that I was really trying to get at in the book. And in a sense, trying to say, look, here are some issues and some figures in the Reformed tradition that might look like they deviate from the norm, but in fact, when we look at them and we look at them in the context of the tradition, they turn out not to be deviant after all. So that's really the whole point of the book, 
to subvert the notion that these views and these figures are espousing notions that are themselves deviant and don't represent Calvinism. In terms of the Reformed tradition and what to say about that, people have different ways of thinking about that. I suppose some people these days think that to be a Calvinist is to subscribe to the so-called five points of Calvinism that are sort of summarized in the acrostic tulip, you know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited, determined, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And there's something to be said for that. I mean, in many respects, those do capture important themes in much uh, Reformed theology down through the last 500 years. But I think I want to say that the Reformed tradition is richer than that. And in some respects, the tulip acrostic may not represent the breadth of the Reformed tradition, and it may give us a sort of false impression of the Reformed tradition if we think that all those people that are Reformed subscribe to all of those five points, and you have to do so in order to be a kind of orthodox as opposed to deviant Calvinist. So I would think of Reformed theology as something broader than that, and to some extent I think of it as a tradition, a theological tradition that's distinguishable from other sorts of theological traditions like, say, Lutheranism, or perhaps Roman Catholicism, or Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy. And that can be characterized by a number of different themes and motifs and notions that are in some ways distinctive. One of which is, I suppose, the emphasis on the Reformed confessions and the desire to summarize the faith in confessions to which the Reformed then adhere. There are other Christian traditions that have confessions, but the Reformed have a bit of a mania for them, and we seem to continue to write them. Although we've got this, the 16th and 17th century confessions that are particularly important, there were reformed confessions right up into the 20th century, if you look at the PCUSA Book of Confessions, for example. So that was one aspect of the reformed tradition, that it is a confessional tradition, and that these confessions are important sort of do- theological norms to some extent. I think also, like any other strand of the Christian faith, you've got particular people, theologians, that are looked to as figures that represent the kind of ideas that are reformed, of course, Calvin, but other people like Zwingli and Bucer, perhaps Cranmer, and a whole constellation of theologians that have come on after them. And then, of course, in addition to that, there are sort of key themes or ideas, and I suppose this is where the tulip stuff comes in, which might be said to be particularly distinctive of reformed theology. And I suppose there are things like the absolute sovereignty of God and an emphasis on what theologians call protology, in other words, the first things as opposed to eschatology, the last things, and in particular, in terms of the first things, God's decrees and his, the, the, the way that he elects to, to create a particular world and a world where sin happens and Christ comes to save us, those sorts of things, that is tied in with a particular way of thinking about divine sovereignty. And alongside those two notions is perhaps a, a sort of family of views about the nature and the extent of the atonement, what it is that Christ's saving work is all about, as, long, as well as rather a kind of family of views about how to think about the nature of salvation and our faith in relation to what God has done for us in Christ. So there are things that are distinctive theological aspects of the tradition as well as particular thinkers and the confessions, but it's not clear to me at least that the distinct doctrines are necessarily in every respect consistent with each of the five points of Calvin. They are in, in broad measure, and I certainly think that the tulip acrostic represents a lot of Reformed theology, but I'm not sure that it's a good way of trying to define Reformed theology over against other streams of thought. Just because, for example, in the book I argue that not every Reformed theologian has adhered to the doctrine of limited atonement, and that's not because they're kind of weird liminal figures who take strange or esoteric views, but that people right at the heart of the Reformed tradition have taken a different view, and that goes back to some of the earliest people in the Reformed tradition. If that's the case, then it looks like at least one of the five points may not represent all of those who self-identify as Reformed and all of those who are regarded by others as Reformed. Well, thank you for that explanation. Very helpful. Now, why don't you give us a a bit of an overview, talking about some of the core themes and, and related to that, the problems that you address in the book. Well, I think, uh, as I've already tried to indicate, the, the themes cluster around the, the scope of salvation and the nature of salvation, and trying to help people to see that maybe there's a breadth in the tradition, that there's more resource in the tradition than sometimes is, is reported in contemporary work on the subject. So, for example, I look at the question of whether our being justified is something which happens in eternity or happens in time, 
if it happens in eternity, what change happens to me when I come to faith in time? Is it just a matter of me seeing myself differently, or is there a real moral change in who I am? That seems to be an important matter that's tied up with this question of antinomianism, whether we can carry on seeing that grace may abound. You know, does it matter what I do if my salvation is secure? and I'm justified in eternity, or is there a sense in which how I behave now it does matter? And so I try to pick up that matter in one of the chapters. And then another issue, of course, that's really important in Christian theology in general, and Reformed theology in particular, is if God is sovereign, in what way am I free? And some people have said, well, to be Reformed, you must think that God determines all that takes place, and any freedom that you have is consistent with God determining that you do one thing rather than another. Now, although I think that's true uh, to some extent, it seems to me that there's another sense in which and many Reformed thinkers, our bondage to sin does mean that we can't choose our salvation, that God's grace has to turn us, as it were, to the matter of salvation. But that there may be ways in which in mundane matters, we really do have alternatives at the moment of choice, and that makes for a rather different account of the relationship between human freedom and divine sovereignty than some people report with respect to the Reformed tradition, and I try and trace this through some of the Reformed confessions and indicate ways in which that comes up also in some important Reformed thinkers. Then there are a number of chapters that deal with or have the word universalism in the title. One of those is about whether the idea if that God does determine everything, this common Reformed theme, pushes us in the direction of the idea that God saves everybody through the work of Christ. You know, If God can determine all things and there's nothing stopping him from bringing about what he wants to happen, then why does God not will the salvation of all people through Christ? Surely it's a better world if there is a salvation of all people than a world where fewer people are saved. And if God can do that, then it would seem like there's a good reason for God to bring about a world where everybody gets saved. And yet Christian teaching is he doesn't do that. Well, why not? So that's a matter of what I call Augustinian universalism. Here I'm kind of trying to paint a picture of a kind of thought experiment. How would this go? You know, imagine a situation in which we think of God doing this sort of thing. What problems are there with that? How do we resist that from the point of view of Reformed and and traditional Christian teaching about the nature of human destiny, some people going to be with God and, and others not? And then I take that up in a subsequent chapter where I try and construct an argument to resist this claim of Augustinian universalism, that the logic, as it were, of the Reformed or the Augustinian view presses in the direction of universalism. So those two chapters are interrelated. And then I pick up another matter that has universalism in the title, though it's slightly different. This is called hypothetical universalism. And on this view, the idea is that Christ dies for all human beings in some sense, although only the elect are given faith, which is an importantly different way of looking at the scope of salvation than is sometimes reported by those who take the so-called limited atonement view. And it's different in this way that those who think Christ's atonement is limited claim that in God's intention and application in what is accomplished and applied in the work of Christ, Christ dies only for the elect. So there's not a sense in which his saving work is intended to save those who are not elect. And it doesn't accomplish that either, it only accomplishes the salvation of the elect. Whereas on this more expansive view, and here I look particularly at the work of Bishop John Davenant, who was an Anglican theologian who was present at the Synod of Dort, this other view says, no, it's in fact the case that Christ's work is sufficient in principle for all. Uh, He dies for everybody, and that's reflected in Scripture in places like John 3.16. But it's only applied, effectively, to the elect whom God gives the gift of faith. Now, this sort of notion, and the distinction that lies behind it between the sufficiency of Christ's work for all, but its efficiency only for the elect, is a very old notion that goes way back beyond the Reformation, and you can find it right back in the work of the medieval theologian Peter Lombard. But what's interesting is that the Reformation, a number of Reformed thinkers continue to use it. And even someone like John Davenant, who was the leader of the British delegation to the Synod of Dort, and who signed the Synod to Dort on behalf of the British delegation, had apparently no qualms in signing it, though he held these views. Now, that seems to be not what one would expect, given the way that the kind of limited atonement view, as represented by supposedly the five points of Calvinism, that in turn supposedly represent the canons of the Synod of Dort, are reported. So that's interesting. And then I try to deal with an objection to the universal atonement view of that chapter, the idea that if Christ dies for everybody, then it looks like there's a double payment 
being made. On the one hand, Christ pays the price for my sin, but then if I fail to have faith and am damned, then I pay for my sin again. And so it looks like I'm paying for my sin twice over, and that's unjust. And so it's argued that's the reason for resisting the universal atonement view and embracing the limited atonement view. And in that chapter, I try and show that, in fact, there's reason for thinking that that objection doesn't hold, and that, in fact, there may be a sense in which Christ does die for all. His work is sufficient in principle for all. A bit like, you know, you might have a vaccination made up so that you can vaccinate the entire populace in some remote village. So you have, in principle, enough to save everybody, but only those who have faith in you as a medic and come to have the vaccine are going to actually be inoculated and saved. So similarly, with respect to this particular objection, it might well be that Christ's work is for all, but the, those who are damned aren't paying double, as it were. They're actually paying the price for their own sin because of the way in which Christ's work is applied to them. It's not effectually applied to them, it's only effectually applied to those of the elect who have faith. So those are some of the issues that the book deals with. And I try to also talk a little bit about how to approach some of these matters in terms of theological method and how to think about faith. So that's the chapter, the prefix as a whole, but that's the kind of core set of themes pertaining to faith and salvation. All right. Well, thanks for that, as you might call it, flyover of the book, giving us an idea of some of the ground that you cover. And now we're going to mix things up a bit for this interview and include some questions from Josh Torrey. He's uh, one of our book reviewers who recently wrote a review for Deviant Calvinism and Josh is an active part of a lot of the online book reviewing communities that I'm personally a part of. And for folks who might be interested in connecting with Josh, you can check out his blog where he posts an awful lot of book reviews, which is at torygazette.com. And you can also find him on Twitter where he goes by the handle at Ben Nguyen, which I'll spell it out for you. It's at B-E-N-N-U-W-N. And here's Josh's first question. What topics just missed being discussed in Deviant Calvinism? Were there some topics that didn't quite make the cut? That's an interesting question. There are other issues in the neighborhood that I'm interested in pursuing and would have liked to have written about and may well write write about sometime, but I suppose they didn't make it in. And some of those have to do, again, with this question of the scope of salvation. So I think there are interesting issues to still be resolved about things like the scandal of particularity, for example. You know, if, as Reformed theologians have thought, and other Christians, of course, have thought, the scope of Christ's work is such that not everybody is saved, however you construe that, how do we understand the fact that it looks like the Gospel's only given to a particular number of people, and there are plenty of other people in the world who just happen to be born in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps, and don't hear the Gospel and through no fault of their own, as a consequence of not hearing the gospel, at least as many traditional theologians have thought, are going to hell as a result. You know, it's, it almost seems unjust that they're in that position. Now, there's been discussion about how to respond to that question, and uh, a number of debates about that that include uh, representatives of the Reformed tradition. And that's a topic that I think is related to some of the themes in the book and that could be usefully discussed. And I think there are, as with the other topics in the book, resources in the tradition that perhaps aren't always recognized that may be more expansive than we might think. For example, someone like William Shedd in the 19th century who has a more expansive view about the scope of salvation in Christ than perhaps many Reformed people today might be comfortable with. Or another one is, of course, Huldrych Zwingli. And uh, Huldrych Zwingli, in his uh, sermon on the providence of God and elsewhere, argues that Christ's work may be applied even to those people who don't have explicit Christian faith, which may be a a somewhat shocking thing for some Reformed thinkers to hear, but it's interesting that Zwingli, who is right at the start of the Reformation, is hardly a liminal figure, but is right at the heart of the magisterial Reformation, nevertheless holds these much more optimistic views about the scope of salvation who will be included within it. He thinks, for example, that Seneca may well be included within the scope of Christ's work. So that's another issue that didn't, as it were, make the cut, but is a fascinating topic. It's being discussed currently in various parts of the theological literature. Uh, Reform thinkers are making useful contributions, and perhaps, you know, at some point I might write about that, but uh, at some later date. All right, well, thank you for that answer. And now on to Josh's next question. What, if any, correlation do you see between eternal justification and the Lutheran understanding of objective subjective justification? 
That's an interesting one. I suppose by objective subjective, he might have some notion in mind of the alien righteousness of Christ and objective um, justification in Christ in that regard, and then our subjective appropriation of that by the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that is that what he has in mind? I'm not quite sure. But if he does have that in mind, then I suppose there is some hookup with what I am thinking about in the chapter on eternal justification, but it's a rather different end of the debate, if you like. Now, justification is a hot potato these days, and Reformed thinkers have weighed in on, on one side or the other about what they think about matters of justification, just as others have in their turn, and the debate rages on. I was seeking to address the question of justification from the point of view of, as I've said earlier, protology, in other words, what God ordains from the creation of the world, and how my salvation and my justification might be caught up with what God has ordained for me, so that there's a question about, well, what difference does actually my coming to faith really make? If I'm already saved in the purposes of God in eternity, if God has ordained that I be justified in eternity, and that Christ's work brings us about, then my coming to faith in time by the work of the Holy Spirit, is that just me coming to know something that's already true about myself, that God has eternally decreed? Or is it actually some sense in which that eternal decree is activated in time at the moment that I come to faith, or something else? Maybe it's entirely something that takes place in time and is only brought about through Christ's work in time and the application of that by the Holy Spirit. So there are different options, and I try to explore those. For some in the 17th century reform debates, there was a worry that people who espoused the doctrine, some version of the doctrine of eternal justification, were implicitly saying that it doesn't really matter how we live now if we're justified in eternity because everything that we do now, every simple thing is covered by the work of Christ and God has ordained our salvation. And so, like those that Paul speaks to in Romans 6, we can carry on seeing that grace may abound. Well, of course, that's not a good idea. And that's not something that we want to adopt, and that's a kind of antinomial, anti-law view, moral law that is. I try to argue in this chapter that you can have a version of eternal justification that is not antinomian, that those two things are separate, but nevertheless one could tie justification in some important sense to God's eternal counsels. Now I suppose that the Lutheran doctrine and the Lutheran distinction between the objective and subjective dimensions of justification are related to that but in a slightly different way. So I suppose you could enrich the argument of my chapter or take it in a certain direction that would lead you to encounter and deal with these additional components. And I suppose much would depend on what you thought the nature of justification was, whether you thought it happens in eternity or something that begins in eternity is activated in time, or whether you think it's something that's ordained in eternity but takes place entirely in history, as to what you would say in response to that particular Lutheran distinction. So I guess they do hook up in important respects. I don't hook them up in the chapter, but there certainly would be an interesting discussion to be had about how one ought to hook those things up. All right, and thank you for that answer. Now we'll move on to Josh's final question, and the question is, doesn't the God must display essential attributes in eternal judgment argument against universalism make God in his very nature dependent upon creation? And how does this correspond with orthodox understanding of God's self-sufficiency? That's an interesting question. I don't actually think it does make God dependent on creation, and I don't think it in any way undermines or challenges the orthodox understanding of God's self-sufficiency, although you might think on the face of it that it does. So here's the idea, and then after I've just explained the idea, I'll explain why I don't think it challenges that sort of issues. So the idea is this, that if God creates a world, then there's a sense in which he must display his attributes, the the panoply of his attributes, including his mercy and his justice, in order that his name be vindicated and glorified, so that his creatures must see the different aspects of his character unfold in the kind of narrative story of creation. And that's why, at the end of all things, some people depart to, to perdition and some people go to be with Christ forevermore because there must be a sense in which God's justice, as well as his mercy, is displayed in the created order. Now, you might say, well, doesn't that mean God's dependent on the creation? He, he needs the creation in order to display his attributes, so he has to create some kind of world in order for that to be the case. Some Christian theologians have gone down that road, actually, and some that you might be surprised by. For example, a good Reformed theologian and evangelical, Jonathan Edwards, who argues that God must create a world and must create this world. But that's a doctrine that many Christian theologians and many Reformed theologians have sought to resist, partly because 
they think that the freedom of God must mean that God is free to create or not to create a world. That God, if he is independent of the created order, if he doesn't depend on the creation, must be free to refrain from creating anything. He doesn't need the creation or, the, or creatures that he creates in order to be infinitely happy and glorious. The, the creatures, including us, don't add anything to the glory of God. If that's the case, then there seems to be some problem, so this objection goes, with the view that God must create a world in which all his characteristics are displayed. But the claim here isn't that God has to create a world in which all his characteristics are displayed in order for him to be happy and glorious, but only this, that if he creates a world, that world is a world in which his attributes are displayed in order to glorify his name. So there's no commitment here to God having to create a world, only that Provided he decides to create a world, this is the kind of world that he's going to create, one that's consistent with his displaying his attributes. Now, if that's the claim, that that's clearly consistent, in turn, with the notion that God is free not to create a world, and that in some fundamental sense, God is independent of the created order, and he doesn't need the created order in order for him to be infinitely happy. It's merely that if he does create a world, in order for it to be a world that adequately reflects his character, the character of its designer and creator, it's got to be a world that has his divine attributes displayed in it. All right, and thank you for that answer as well. And Josh, thanks for submitting these questions and for being a part of this interview today. Now we're going to move back to a few of my closing questions. Oliver, when readers get to the end of deviant Calvinism, what's the the core message or maybe even a, a call to action that you hope they come away with? That's a good question. I mean, I think the main message I want to convey is that the Reformed tradition is a rich and variegated tradition, and that there's a real heritage there that those who self-identify with the Reformed tradition can appropriate and utilize for contemporary constructive theological purposes. So, in a sense, my call is to a kind of theological retrieval. Let's look back in order to look forward. Let's go to the resources of the past and mine them in order that we can bring the ideas into the contemporary discussion to construct theology in order to serve the church more effectively today. And I think a concern that motivates the book in many respects is that although there is that work being done in the Reformed tradition, there's some very fine pieces of work in that vein today, more of that's needed. And sometimes the reports one is given of the Reformed tradition is really only a report on some tiny fraction of the Reformed tradition that's sometimes thought to stand in for the whole. You know, you mistake the part for the whole. As if, for example, Princetonian 19th century theology represents the whole of the Reformed tradition. You know, that Charles Hodges' views are the views of the whole Reformed tradition, and that Charles Hodges is an important and creative theologian. But sometimes, because Hodge was someone who said there was never a theological innovation at Princeton whilst I had tenure, People think that, well, that must mean that he's just passing on the faith of the reformers of the 16th century. Well, that's not actually the case. And it's not true that Charles Hodge simply represents the reformed tradition or his views are identical with the reformed tradition as a whole. There are other voices that have other views on all sorts of important topics. And many of those topics are such that the variety of views are permissible within the bounds of the reformed confessions. So what I'm saying is, Let's reappropriate those resources. Let's look again at the riches of the Reformed tradition. Let's celebrate that, and let's use those things for bettering our theology today. And I hope that's one of the central takeaways from the book. All right. And next, uh, a sort of a two-part question. As you were putting this book together, was there an intended reader you had in mind? And sort of related to that, how would you see this book possibly being used in a classroom setting? I was hoping that there'd be people who had an interest in Reformed theology and who might be those who fall into the camp of, I've got some notion of the Reformed tradition, I kind of think that's associated with Tulip or something like that, the five points of Calvinism, and that they might find this book enriches and broadens their sense of what the Reformed tradition is and then galvanizes them, if you like, to go and find out more for themselves. So, I did have a readership in mind, and that's the readership. And I suppose in my job, I come across a lot of students who are seeking to find their own way theologically. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them are seeking to find their way theologically and and find their way into some branch of the Reformed faith. And in doing so, they're looking for books that will help them to see what's important in the Reformed tradition, get a sense of the resources that there are in the Reformed tradition, 
And I suppose I hope that in some modest way, this might help some of those people. I mean, I hope it will also be of interest to those people who are established in the Reformed tradition and have a good sense of what the tradition is about, and it might help them to see maybe some issues in a slightly different light, or at least challenge them to do so, challenge them to think again on some matters. But in many respects, I was seeking to reach out to those people who are thinking through some of these things and to help them to see that perhaps there's a breadth and a depth and a richness there that sometimes we might not think is the case. And, and also, along the same lines, that some questions that sometimes seem to be closed theologically in some discussions, one might find by appealing to various resources in the tradition are not necessarily closed, that they're, they're more open than we think they are, and that there are, there's more resources out there to appeal to than sometimes we think. So those are the sorts of people I'm hoping will be interested in the book. What would its use be in the classroom? Well, I suppose it might be used in the classroom where you're trying to offer students resources or accounts of the Reformed tradition that do that, that try and show that there's a breadth and depth and richness, and are trying to address some of the questions that I think a number of Reformed thinkers these days are trying to address in terms of looking back in order to look forward. And it may well be that the book would be useful in classes of that sort. It might also be useful in classes that are particularly concerned with the scope of salvation, the relationship between Reformed and Arminian theology, and related matters along those lines. So I guess there could be a, a sort of a use in more historically oriented classes as well as more doctrinally or philosophically oriented classes as well. All right, very helpful. Thank you for those answers. Now, Oliver, if the listeners are interested in finding out more about you or connecting with you, where's the best place for them to seek you out on the web? I don't actually, I'm not a blogger. I read blogs, but I'm not a blogger. So I don't have a blog that people can go and read, at least not at the moment. Probably the best and easiest way to get more information on me, if you're interested, is to go to the website of Fuller Seminary where I work. So if you go to www.fuller.edu and you look up the faculty page on the School of Theology, or probably, I don't know, but probably if you Google my name alongside Fuller, you'll get a hit that will eventually lead you to a page that has a picture of me and some details on it. So that would probably be the quickest way to get some information. All right. And for folks who are interested in that information, I'll also include links to Oliver's profile page there on the Fuller Seminary website. So look for that in the show notes. And this brings us to the close of this episode of Fortress Press Live. Again, if you'd like to find out more about Deviant Calvinism, you can head on over to the Fortress Press website, which you'll find at fortresspress.com. I'll also include links in the show notes for this episode. You can find that at fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 015. This is episode 15 of the podcast. And Oliver, I just want to say thanks so much for being generous with your time today and for being a part of this episode of Fortress Press Live. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for taking the time to listen in on my discussion with Oliver Crisp. We hope that this has been an enjoyable listening experience for you. I do want to encourage you to head over to iTunes and leave us a review if you haven't already. It may not seem like a big deal, but it's an important way that you can help new listeners find the show. If you'd like to join the conversation or read the show notes for this episode, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 015. Until next time, this is your host Sean Tabbitt, signing off.